Max Eisen was just 15 years old when officers arrived at his home in the former Czechoslovakia and ordered his entire family to pack up and leave. They were deported to Auschwitz, where all but Max were eventually exterminated. More than seven decades after his liberation, he details it all in his book, By Chance Alone, a remarkable true story of courage and survival at Auschwitz. And Max Eisen joins us now here in our studios. It's a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank and I you must say, you. having read your book, I cannot believe you are alive. It is a truly, I mean, it's a miracle you're alive. Yeah. But we'll get into it. I'm so thankful to be alive. As you should be. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, an excerpt from your book, Mr. Eisen. I will always remember our final Seder, the Passover Seder. It is deeply etched in my memory. I remember my entire family seated around a beautifully set table. My grandfather and grandmother, my father and mother, my uncle Eugene and my aunt Irene, my two younger siblings, Eugene and Alfred, and baby Judith in her crib. The candles burned in their candelabra. The beautiful dishes were laid out, and the heads of the family, my grandfather, my father, and my uncle, were leaning on cushions to symbolize relaxation and freedom from slavery in Egypt. After the reading and singing of the story, we had a dinner of several courses that lasted about four hours. For us, this was our last supper together, which you didn't know at that moment. What happened after that supper ended? <clears throat> well, um, I think we retired about 12 o'clock, and my grandfather, father and uncle, and I, we were outside in the yard. It was a beautiful, balmy night. And my grandfather and, and uh, my father and uncle were talking about the situation of the war, and my grandfather said, if we manage to survive another five to six months, we'll be safe. We were that close, and yet so far, we didn't know that plants were being uh, hatched in town. The gendarmes were arriving from neighboring towns, and they were going to collect us the ne very next morning. Well, you say you didn't know, but there was a man who came to your home and warned in you. In the middle of the night, somebody was knocking on our gate. We had a closed uh, yard because we had a lumber yard, and we had a guardian, an Alsatian dog, who signaled that somebody's knocking. And the way he was barking, we knew that this is a serious business. And uh, so my father opened the window, or the window was open, I don't recall. And uh, so this forester said, Mr. Ryzen, open the gates. I have to come in. And this was a very unusual event. We had, my father had to get out in the yard and open the big gates. And he came in with his horse and buggy. And he was taken into my grandfather's quarters. And he said, look, I just came from the pub. The gendarmes are all there drinking beer. And uh, they're going to take, they're going to get all the Jewish people tomorrow morning. I want you to come with me right now. And I'm going to take you and hide you in the forest. So my grandfather simply said, no way. This is uh, a Sabbath and it's Passover, and we're just not going to go. And 72 years later, this Friday, it's going to be again the Sabbath and Passover um, at the same time. So uh, we did not know what was going on in occupied Poland in 1944. Let's just set the scene here. You're in rural Czechoslovakia. Did what year is it? 1944. It's 44. Well, we, we were, this was Hungary now. You see, Czechoslovakia was partitioned in 1939, and this part of Slovakia was given to Hungary. Okay. So we were now under Hungarian jurisdiction, and we, these were Hungarian gendarmes that came, and uh, bureaucracy and teachers, they all came from Hungary in 1939. So... I need to ask you a bit of a strange question here. Yeah. Given all of the horrors that were about to follow, have you ever over the years thought, if only my grandfather had made a different decision, we might have been able to avoid all that? I, you know, I often think about it, but you have to understand, we had no news. It, those days were not like you had a cell phone and you took an instant picture. Mm -hmm. We lived in a fascist country and the newspapers were censored. We heard certain things, but you know, people want to believe that, well, things will get better. And we didn't know, perhaps somebody in Budapest knew they could have warned us, but this didn't happen. Hmm. So we paid a very big price, Hungarian Jews. 
or not knowing or what was coming just in the last, you know, in May and the next few months, within three months, 450,000 Hungarian Jews were gassed in Auschwitz-Birkenau for not knowing. So my, father, my grandfather was always the head of the family. His word was the last word. There was no arguing and... Uh, there was no arguing, eh? No, there was no arguing and uh, what grandfather said, that was law. And so his two sons went along, he decided and the yeah, two sons went along it. with it. that's it, yeah. Everybody followed. Well, the gendarmes came, they rounded up your family, mm -hmm. eventually you were we, stuffed in a boxcar and sent well, to Auschwitz. we were taken to the uh, school the next morning and 450 Jews spent the first night sealed off from the town. Can you imagine, you go from your home, which is 20 minutes away from the school, and you spend the first night on the floor, 250 people in one room, 250 in another room. It was a terrible night because we were supposed to have had our second Seder and we are here in a, in a school. I just want to, if I could, when I came back, there was a neighbor that we had. She was a Christian lady and she was a good friend of my mother. So when I came back a year later, she told me, what do you think would happen in a town of 5,000 people where approximately 10% of their population are removed from their homes and they're sealed off in a school? So she told me exactly what happened that night. Every Jewish home was ransacked to the bare walls. We had a beautiful synagogue, 90 Jewish families. We had a beautiful synagogue. The ark, the Torah scrolls were taken out from the ark, cut into ribbons and worse. The prayer books and the Talmudic study books were put in a pyre and torched. This is what happened with people with whom we have lived for generations. Jews have lived in Hungary in that part of the world for 1,900 years. Were we not the true citizens? Jews were there in that part of the world before the Magyars came from Mongolia in the year 900. So what do you think happened? Why, why, why did it happen? <clears throat> well, I. There are a couple of things that happened. Uh, in March of uh, 44, uh, German troops entered Hungary. Eichmann arrived in uh, Hungary. And there was a new uh, fascist government that was, uh, came into power. And uh, I think the instigator probably was Adolf Eichmann. Uh, he was um, the head of transportation of Jews. And I think this is what happened. You see, he just overruled everything. And it's not that the Hungarians were not willingly cooperating with them, you know. It was Hungarian gendarmes that collected all these Jews. They put their priority on collecting Jews when they needed all this rolling stock to take ammunition or supplies to the Eastern Front. Instead, they used all this rolling stock. I mean, these were hundreds and hundreds of transports rolling from Hungary in 1944. And, and, but that's the question. What, with all of the military needs that they had for those trains, for, the, for that rolling stock, and yet they put that aside in order to collect you up and send you to the gas mm -hmm. chambers. Yes. Why? Well, it was hatred that goes back a long way. Uh, you know, Hungary was a country. Uh, they had blood libels in Hungary. They had uh, quotas for Jews. They couldn't attend university. And um, although in Hungary we still lived in our homes, there were no large ghettos until 44. Like in, in Poland, for instance, or in, uh, uh, we, we, we did not live in ghettos. Some Jews in the 1944 towards the end, they were put into certain areas. You could have called it a ghetto, but uh, I think it was hatred. Uh, Jews were always, um, the ones that could be kicked around for some reason. And I think uh, it was an economic grab for most of the people of Europe. Okay. Let's not forget about, you know, it was purely stealing property that Jews have worked for for generations. You describe in some detail in the book the train trip yeah. that you and your family took uh, over several days to get to Auschwitz. Give us some of the detail of what that was like. You're what, 15 years old at the I time? I was 15 years old. 15, okay. What was that like? So, <clears throat> the life in this brickyard was absolutely terrible. There was only two taps of water coming in 
to look after 30,000 Jews in this brickyard in Kasha. Two taps of water. My mother is there with a nine-month-old baby. I can't remember how she looked after the baby. There was a communal latrine that stank for high, to high heaven for miles. There was only one communal latrine for men and women, you know, like a two by four, and there are people sitting in an open pit. And every day, a SS officer arrived in this brickyard. We were brainwashed. She told us a story that you're going to be resettled in the East. Families will be together, and you will be working on farms. Did everybody believe it? Everybody believed it. Because they wanted and to. We couldn't wait to get to this wonderful farm that mm -hmm. it was. To see how the Nazis coded all their terrible deeds that were coded in, in deception. And just to precede that by two years in 1942, when my maternal family were deported from Slovakia, <clears throat> we received a telegram that they were taken away. We were devastated. This is my mother's mother and brothers and sisters, my uncles, aunts, and many of my cousins. A telegram arrived that they were taken away. We didn't know where. 42. A few months later, we received a postcard that had a German eagle on it. And the stamp said, General Government, which Poland was called after it was occupied, Lublin District. And the message on the other side was, we, the Friedman family, are all here together. We are working on farms, and we are awaiting your arrival. Was any of that true? It was not true, but we didn't know that. Several families in my town received similar cards, but families in Slovakia, you see, we were that close. You know, men from my town married girls from, which was all Czechoslovakia at one time. So here I am, remember 1942, this postcard arrives, and now it's 1944, and this SS officer is telling me that we're going to work on farms. What was I thinking that I'm going to meet up with my beautiful cousin somewhere near Lublin on this farm? But what was the train trip like, actually? The train trip was 100 of us, approximately, were stuffed in into this cattle car. Initially, there was a pail of water and a pail for a toilet put in there, and then the doors were locked and bolted down. And then I knew instantly that something isn't right here. And the train took off. Of course, the water was gone. Whoever was near the water was gone immediately. And heat was building up. This was in May. It was very hot. My mother was stuck somewhere in a corner. I couldn't see her all through the three days and nights. My two little brothers were stuck between taller people. You know, we lost control of each other, and I knew that nobody can take care of me. My father was helpless. My grandfather was helpless. And there we were standing together like sardines in a vertical position. How many days? Three days and nights. Two nights or Just three th nights or no, two day, three days and two nights. So the train starts to go and the heat is building up. Two old people died. Babies are crying and you know their babies crying kept, was getting weaker by the day. The train used to stop to uh, the, load, the locomotive needs water and, char and coal. And we were yelling for water, and there was no water. Somebody was boosted up to, to this little opening that was on, on the side of the cattle car and the metal bars when we came to a stop. And he read the name, and somebody said, this is Poland. And that was a shock that we were no longer in Hungary. We are now in a Poland. And um, the train goes on, and night comes, and you fall asleep. I mean, you're that tired. They're standing in one spot, and you, you roll with a group. As I can remember the clicking of the train, the cattle car's wheels on the joints of the tracks, you see, click, click, click. And then the locomotive whistles, and you wake up with a start, and you think you had a nightmare, and you realize that you're actually in a nightmare. So um, the third night, the train came to a stop. It was being shunted back and forth, and these steel bumpers were hitting each other, you know, a yank. So I know now that this was being, we're being uh, shoved in into Birkenau through this, the big uh, guardhouse on the railings. On, <clears throat> so uh, our door opened up, and um, there was a man in a striped jacket and cap, and he was yelling at us, Rausch now. You know, you Get can. Get out quickly. 
That, yeah. And you know, you can actually write a book of what it was like to spend three days together with, with 100 people. Mm. So it was a, absolutely a nightmare. You were dysfunctional. You were deadbeat you, when, you, when you were yanked out on this platform. Did you have any idea where you were when the doors opened? We had no idea. Everything was, you open, they opened up the door of the cattle car and light flooded in. Mm. And I write in my book, it was like light was shown on, the, on this larvae or a, a hive of uh, ants, you know, who are working in the dark and everybody starts to move, tries to get their brains into gear because you are so dysfunctional. And they, you want to find your bundle in this urine and feces in the, you know, on the floor. And they keep telling it, you, don't worry, you'll get it delivered tomorrow. So you see this deception was on, on the platform we were out, and the selection began, and this SS doctor with his white gloves. Was that Mangala? It could have been Mangala, I don't know. He had, uh, but can you imagine the power of one man, a doctor, who swore the Hippocratic Oath? that he will do no harm to people. And with a flick, this flick meant that my mother holding a baby in her arm, my grandparents, my grandfather was 67 years old only. My grandmother, my two younger brothers, he had the power to send them into the gas chamber right from this platform. You see, these were called lives not worth living. My father, uncle, and I, we were chosen for slave labor. Our <clears throat> problem was from Hungarian Jews because 1944, they did not need much slave labor because they were gearing down their own factories in Auschwitz. They, so they were very astute business people. You don't need people, you know, you're not going to feed them, so put them in the gas. Did you have any sense, Mr. Eisen, that when the flick of the wrist went that way for your mother and sister and other siblings, that you'd never see them again? We had no idea. We believed everything they were telling us. I mean, we couldn't think. You were in a strange place. You saw SS men with their, the, these were the Totenkopf division, the death head units with the skull and crossbones. And that was very frightening. And there were many inmates in striped outfits. There was a terrible smell in the air, like burning flesh. Behind me, I could see a plume of flames, angry red flames coming out from somewhere. I thought we, we were in a factory, near a factory somewhere. I didn't know where I was until the next morning. So um, these SS units, those that were chosen for slave labor, uh, they took us, they were in charge of us, and we were running through a birch forest. And in between the forest, there was a fire going in a distance. And I could see, I thought that there were people jumping into the fire uh, I mean, I was in shock. Here are these SS soldiers with this terrible insignia. I've seen Hungarian soldiers and Czech army, which was a very well-equipped army. And these were a different group of people, their eyes and their faces. I knew that they were a threat. And my father just gave me a shot. He says, keep, keep quiet. These were Hungarian Jews, actually, who were gassed, but they were thrown into pits because the crematoria couldn't keep up with the gas chambers. And then we were taken into a sauna. Our clothes were taken away from us. We were processed. Our hair was cut. We went through a shower and into a barrack. We were put into uh, triple-tier bunks. We you, were, your father, your uncle. And my uncle, and we were naked. We had uh, nothing except our boots. And um, we lay down on the wooden planks. And you know, it felt really wonderful to be able to lie down after standing for three days and nights in one spot. This is, this is more than 70 years ago, and yet you still have a remarkable recollection of detail. Do, do you think about this often over the years? <clears throat> well, I think about it, Steve. Uh, you know, I've been speaking for 25 years in schools since 1991. Schools, universities, police, uh, Canadian Forces College, and you know, just groups. And when you're 87 years old, your long-term memory is so vivid. Sometimes I can't remember where I put my keys down the day before. But this long-term memory, and um, I had to start and write my story with pencil and paper. Uh, and I had to sit down, and I was able to see this entire picture right from the beginning. I have interviewed Holocaust survivors who were around your age when it happened to them, 
And some say they can't remember what their parents looked like anymore. They can't remember what their siblings looked like. Um, do you have those problems as well? No, I remember their faces very vividly. I can see them in my mind's eye. I can see my maternal grandmother, my two uncles who were tending the farm, Herman and Pavel. They were two big guys. They were riding their beautiful horses. And uh, I remember my cousins uh, who were deported to Majdanek from Slovakia while we were in Hungary. Um, no, I, I can remember them pretty well. Yeah. You were nine months in Auschwitz? I was approximately nine months. Nine in months in... From the May the um, 8th, I believe, to January the 12th. What kinds of things did you do to just live another day? Well, <clears throat> you, need, you know, you needed to have a certain skills and a preparation and uh, you need a tremendous amount of resilience to survive Auschwitz. And I had all kinds of skills, skills that my grandfather taught me, my mother, skills I learned from my father, my uncles. Uh, I did most of my, the person that I was really depending on was my grandfather. Imagine on a market day, we had a huge yard, farmers come to the market, mm -hmm. They bring their goods and they parked in our yard. So after they sold their goods on the market, they came back and they bought lumber from our yard. In the meantime, there were anywhere from 10 to 15 horses and wagons in our yard. So after they bought the lumber, my grandfather used to have a sort of an indelible pencil, put it in his ledger binder, so many two by fours. At the end of the season, they would barter, the farmers would bring us grain or livestock. So when the carts were gone, my grandfather and I, we had to clean up the yard with long brooms to collect all the manure. And you know, this was a good thing because we used this manure in our vegetable garden, you see. So, you know, these were life skills that I learned from them. So I needed all these skills when I arrived in the camp. And, um, um, But I'm referring to things like, if you were caught sneaking food, you could be killed. You, cut, you snuck food anyway and somehow managed to get away with it. If you didn't, you know, if you looked at an SS officer the wrong way, they would take their guns and, and you know, kill you right there where you stood. And somehow you managed not to have that happen to you. Do you know why somehow you managed every step of the way to live just another okay. day? See, my father and uncle, who were working in labor battalions for years under the Hungarians, they sort of helped me to get acclimatized to life in this terrible place. I mean, when we arrived here, you looked at other prisoners who were there maybe six, seven months. I mean, these were hardcore people who were bitter, skinny. I mean, people would kill for a crumb of bread. I've seen the best and the worst. And um, the only time when I was able to get my uh, way up a bit is when I started to work in the operating room. I was able to keep myself clean and uh, I was able to cook a meal. You'll read it in the book. Do you know what? Before you go there, because yeah. I want to explain how you ended up there. Okay. You, you, did a, you, you had a lot of terrible jobs before that. Yes. But then, ironically, one day, uh, an SS guard took the butt of his gun and cracked you right over the back of your yeah. head. And you thought, okay, that was it. that's it. They're going to take me off to the crematorium. I can't work anymore. They're going to take me off to the crematorium and they're going to be yeah. killed. Yeah. And here's what you say in the book. I thought of my family and how they must have felt when facing their own demise. When my mother entered the gas chamber, she had my three siblings in her care. How she must have fought until the last breath in that horrible chamber. What would it be like for me, slow or fast? Would my soul leave my body? How would I meet my family again? Would they all be waiting for me? How would I know them? What shape or form would they be in? I felt utterly alone with no one to take care of or comfort me. No one could save me. Now, at this moment of complete desperation, it actually turned out to be great for you because you ended up being taken by this wonderful doctor and your life was saved. How'd that happen? Well, this was a way out. Uh, misfortune became my best fortune, you see. Like somebody else said, Primo Levi, I believe that if a door didn't open for you, you couldn't walk out of this place alive. So, uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough that I was taken back to camp. And uh, the under couple, 
who was a Polish political prisoner. I was thrown on a two-wheeler cart where all the shovels and pickaxes were, and we marched six kilometers back to camp. And this undercouple, whose name was Stasek, he made sure that two inmates took me off before we entered the gates, and they had to carry me from the gate to Barrack 21. Have you ever been to Auschwitz? Mm -hmm. A few Do you times. Remember Barrack 21, the Chirurgische Abteilung, the surgery department. Mm -hmm. It's near at the far end on your right side where the laundry is. And he made sure that they brought me right inside the operating, the, the hallway near the operating the surgery. Had he not done that, I would have bled to death right in, inside the gate. So that was a, a lucky, you know, lucky thing that he did this. And um, the doctor, of course, he took me off his stretcher, you know, that if you couldn't walk away from the hospital, you were taken away to the gas chamber. And he took me off and he brought me into the operating room, gave me a lab coat, and I became the cleaner and the orderly. And uh, this, was, this was my luck, you know, that uh, had he not done this, I wouldn't be here to tell the story. Well, you say it was your luck, and, and I want to get into some discussion here about whether it was luck, whether it was divine intervention. Did you think at that moment, God is saving me, or what did you think? I didn't think of God. I came from a traditional Orthodox family, and uh, I, that was the least of my things that I was thinking of. And I kept wondering, how can, this, how can these things happen? And uh, uh, I think... Um, when I was brought into the operating room, there was a young Polish student there, a medical student. And he was leaving some Polish people who were sent to Auschwitz for some misdeed, political something. He was sentenced for one year in Auschwitz, and then he was allowed to go home. So he spent this one year, and he was going to leave in a few days. So maybe that was a reason that... And there were two Jewish doctors in the ward upstairs. One was a Polish Jewish doctor, Dr. Jakub Gordon, and the uh, French uh, Jewish doctor, Samuel Steinberg, from Paris. And, you know, these doctors, they were communicating with each other. And uh, so maybe that was something that everybody knew that this student is leaving, and maybe this was something. I don't know whether there was a discussion like that or not. Hmm. But I think maybe there was. So I filled that void. And uh, so. When I started to work there, the student left three days later. And I just fitted in, and with all my skills that I learned as an apprentice, and, uh, you know, I was the best cleaner there was. I mean, that operating room, the prep room, and another room, was, it had to shine every morning before we were getting ready for operations. And we used to operate starting about 12.30 or so, anywhere six, seven, eight operations, depending on what we had in the lineup. Who was the doctor? Polish doctor. The chief doctor was Dr. Tadeusz Jeszko. He was a uh, surgeon. He from he worked at the Radom uh, Hospital. He was arrested by the Gestapo because uh, he was in the Polish underground, and uh, he wound up in the hospital in Berek 21 as a patient. He was beaten up to such a in a bad state, and then they found out that he was a Dr. Jeszko. He was made the chief surgeon. That's him. Yeah. 131527 is his tattooed number. You remember I remember his this. I mean, I saw, you know, he's washing up and his sleeves are rolled up. And he's, he's a very strong man. He was about 42 years old. Not Jewish. No, no. He was a Polish mm -hmm. political prisoner. And um, both surgeons were, the other one was Dr. Zbigniew Sobestiansky. And, um, so uh, the difference was Dr. Rzeszko, every Polish political prisoner was allowed to receive a small parcel once a month. Can you imagine a, a receiving a parcel from home that had a little bit of a, a salami in it, a piece of bread, and maybe a little piece of uh, some kind of a cake and some sweets? I mean, I remember when they opened up these packages, you see a small bread was cut into pieces by the guards. They wanted to make sure that there was nothing hidden inside. Hmm. And he would always share something with me. And they were allowed to write a letter once a month, receive a letter and write a letter home. These were the political prisoners. You see, they were all kinds of people in this camp. They were uh, killers, asocials, they were gay people. 
so we Jews who had the star of David and a number, we were on the bottom of the list. Everybody else was on top of us, and the political prisoners were on the top of them all. You see, Auschwitz one was run by the Polish intelligentsia. They were the first inmates there. So they had the seniority. They ran the entire camp. Uh, every block, uh, every barrack had a, a barrack elder and a room elder, and these were all these Polish political prisoners. They worked together very well, you know. I mean, this was for their own safety, and there were a lot of things going on, you know. They had a shortwave radio from what I learned after. I didn't know these things when I was there. So they were a support group. They supported each other. And the rest, you know, you just fell by the wayside. You had to be very resourceful and organized. Every minute you had to have your mind, how can you have another grace, uh, blade of grass or something? Because hunger was unbelievable. When you're living in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. do, you, do you hope that someday some soldier is going to come and rescue you from all of this? Well, the only hope I had... I remember <clears throat> it was probably in July or maybe middle of June, there was a, an alarm that American bombers were coming. We figured out, I, I didn't know, there was a siren sounded and they were rushing all the units back to camp. So, and then you could hear the hum of hundreds of engines and suddenly on a clear blue, blue sky day, you see hundreds of these huge bombers in squadrons flying over. You were happy about that. It was the most majestic sight. <laughs> and I said, keep coming. And then the bombs were falling. Never on the camp. They were pinpointing all the huge factories, especially IG Farben in Monowitz. Uh, <clears throat> and the flak, the anti-aircraft guns, you know, these 88 millimeter guns, they were all starting to shoot. They were right at the perimeter fence of Auschwitz one. And you know, the racket and the shrapnel that was flying. And we were standing and we saw, we kept saying, keep dropping the bombs. We didn't care. I would rather be, be killed by an American bomb than die in a horrible way. And this went on every day, exactly at 12 o'clock at noon. And um, at night, the British were bombing. Given all the death that you saw, though, did you assume that at some point you would be killed as well? Look. I knew that the finale is going to be that they'll kill us all. I never had any idea. I, I, I was striving to live from second to second, from day to day. I mean, second to second was a real heavy task, you know, because you didn't know. You could not have long range plans here. All you needed to have is a will to go on, you know, and you'd put one foot in front of the other. But I knew that the finale is going to be a bad scenario. When they, because I knew that the Reich was collapsing and they'd be revengeful and kill us. So, uh, and this is what they did. You know, I was on the death march. Some 30,000 of us were marched out on January the 12th, in this bitter cold. Well, we should explain that because w when Auschwitz was liberated, you weren't there anymore, right? No, it was on January the 27th. Right. So and you I left on already. the 12th, you see. They'd marched you on a death march. I mean, it's an astonishing. How far? How far did you go? We walked about maybe 150 kilometers. This took us about three days. Can you imagine in snow up to your ankles, thousands of people and many in wooden clogs. Mm. Five of us hooked our arms together so that you are a unit, you know, and you have to carry some people and you feel that this guy is kind of heavy and you look and he's a frozen piece of uh, dead meat, you know, mm. and you just drop them and people who fell out of the column they dispatched them with a bullet in their head. And uh, the highways and byways, you know, we didn't go in the main highways. They took us on the side roads in forests, and they were littered with bodies. Did you get fed? No, uh, we were not fed for 13 days. When we left Auschwitz, they gave us a piece of bread as we went through the gate. And you had nowhere to keep it, so you ate it right away. So when a body was dead, and before we dropped them, we used to tear off a strip of their uniform, the striped outfit, you know. Every piece of rag was a piece, was a big treasure. You had to cover your ears. You were black from frostbite. You had to strip some material to put it around your boots. We were soaking wet because from the exertion, even though it was freezing, but your body was being dehydrated. We're grabbing handfuls of snow and that was not good. And uh, 
after three days, they put us into open flat cars. And we went through Dresden, south into occupied Czechoslovakia to Pilsen. And from Pilsen, we arrived in uh, Mauthausen. Uh, on January the 25th of 45, we arrived in Mauthausen. And that was 13 days without a drop of food. How, how does anybody survive Look, 13 days when you food? keep on going, you don't need food anymore. You just keep on going of the little muscle that you have, and you keep marching by like a robot, like a zombie. You know, once your system is such that, you know, your stomach is that little. And uh, I don't know, I wasn't hungry, and we spent another four days on top of that in Mauthausen without a drop of food. And then they loaded us onto cattle cars again. I wound up in a place called Melk, uh, which was on the Danube. And uh, we were working in shafts that we were building. We were hacking this out from a mountain, from rocks. A huge tunnels that a train could back right in. They were building, there were six tunnels. Four were already operating. They were building um, aircraft parts and uh, ball bearings, I think. A train backed right in and loaded up the carts, and we were building the other two. And you had to sort of cut the rock with an air hammer. Mm. I arrived there, and they gave me an air hammer. You know, everything was so heavy. And the shaking, you know. You're trying with these huge drills, and you're trying to cut this rock. You had to build sort of a staircase to go up higher. It had to be shaped in a certain way. And the second day, this work was uh, uh, run by a civilian organization called the Tote Organization. And I said to this foreman, who had a black uniform with a black forage cap, and I said, look, I can't lift this air hammer anymore, you know. And uh, so he said, OK, you collect the bits. The drills are breaking. You're, you're, you're hacking into rock. Mm -hmm. So these drills are breaking. These are heavy drills. They're about that diameter. He said, collect the drills and take them out to the smithy. And so they, I, that's what I did, collected these drills. So that was another good thing. I had a kind of a job that I could save some time and sleep in the smithy under the table. The blacksmith was a Russian prisoner of war who did this work. So that was a, And in Melk, <clears throat> this was in the winter. It was uh, February and March. And I, I got a, a stomach flu or dysentery and everything combined. And I thought, this is going to be the end of me. And this Misha was his name. He told me, he says, I couldn't keep any food down. He said, you've got a stomach problem. He said, here's a piece of charcoal and eat this. And I was eating charcoal for two days. Charcoal? Charcoal. Hmm. And after two days, uh, this fixed me up. We were marching back to camp, <clears throat> and my stomach just let loose. And you know, you couldn't put up your hand when you're marching in a column. 1,500 people, the shift, going back to camp, and uh, look, I need to go to the toilet. There was no such thing. So, and my stomach just let loose. And you know, the instant this happened, I felt like a million bucks, honest. <laughs> and see, he knew um, food I couldn't keep down, but this chalk was sort of soaked up all the poisons, and I was okay, but I had a big problem. How do you wash it? And anyway, this was a... So luck and resilience played a big part. Well, again, y y okay, yeah. but the title of the book is By Chance Alone, which makes me infer from that that you think it was, you know, overwhelming good luck on your part that you're, you happen to be here today. Uh, I'm coming back to God. Do you believe in God anymore? I do. I kept thinking somebody must be watching over me. You know, I mean, it's, I tell you, when I was really down and out, I was in real bad, I used to make deals with God. I said, my God, if you let me survive another day, I'll be the best person. I'll pray every day and all these things, you know. I mean, you do anything and everything. And uh, how, do you, how do you continue to believe in God when you're surrounded by so much misery? Well, I'm not sure that I, I believe in it, in him or her, I'm not sure, but uh, that was the only thing that you could do. <laughs> there was no other way to, I had no other way of petitioning anybody 
so I could talk to myself or in private to him, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe it will help. So, how were you eventually liberated? I was liberated in um, Apenzell, uh, which is in Austria. Which is in Austria. Melk, we left in um, end of March. They loaded us up. Melk is a place where they have the biggest Franciscan monastery in, the, in Europe. And so they brought us down to the Danube and they packed us in into river barges. If you've been to Holland, you see these barges that are being pulled on the uh, canals mm -hmm. and they cover the gate and one tugboat was pulling four or five of these barges on cables. And we were hauled up to Linz. And we disembarked in Linz and we walked for three days up to the mountains to Abensee. I arrived there at the beginning of April, 1945. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, and I write about it in, in the book here, we came up on the mountainside from a sharp turn. And I'm looking down and I see this gorgeous lake below me. This is beginning of April, 45, and I see rowboats on the lake. And Luftwaffe guys, the Air Force in the blue uniform with their girlfriends in the boat rowing on this beautiful lake. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to have a boat too. You know, I was always trying to look for something, you know. Positive to keep you going. Positive, and I loved scenery, and I always picked up these things. And uh, so those were, uh, it was a bad month because this was the end and the Reich was finished and there was no more work. They shut the camp, they threw away the key. They didn't give us our rations. Typhus broke out and it was killing people by the thousand. There were mountains of bodies piled up. Millions of flies flying all over the place. It was hot, the bodies were decomposing. And finally it hit me, I got typhus. Typhus was a terrible thing. Lice were burrowed under our skin and they carried the, you know, the bacteria from body to body. Mm -hmm. And there were no doctors or medicine. And I started with sleeping on the top bunk when I arrived in Apenze and finally I was in the lower bunk because I had, didn't have the strength to climb up. And uh, people were just keeling over right in the floor of the hut, of the barrack. And it was, I found out after it was May the 6th, I'm in the lower bunk. I woke up, somebody is mumbling away. He shuffles in in his wooden clogs on the cement floor and he's mumbling that the guards are no longer in the tower. And no longer in the tower and I keep hearing, I says, I must be, I must be having a fever dream. Uh, you see, my system was shutting down. It's, this is the end, you know, you, when you don't want food, you're, you're, and I thought I need to, find this out. And with my last ounce of strength, I knew that if I don't get out of this terrible place, I'll never get out of here. I had to crawl over cadavers and I was out in front of the barrack and I could see that the tower was empty. I mean, that was a miracle. I mean, there, there's no SS guard. They were there 24 seven, sitting beside a machine gun and a searchlight. And uh, seconds later, the gate is flying in and the tank is coming through. It had a white star on it, and I said, wow, this is better than this. the, you know, the cross of the uh, tank units. And there were black soldiers sitting on the turret. These are American soldiers? American soldiers. And uh, I'll never forget that sight. This tank is coming through, and it stops. And the soldiers were on top of the turret. Can you imagine what they were looking at? This was a unit that came through the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm a crack unit that worked under General Patton's Third Army. And I know this from Sergeant Johnny Stevens, whom I met many years later in Toronto. But I looked at their eyes. Their eyes were like saucers. They were in shock what they were looking at. They never saw a sight like this. And the smell, we couldn't smell the decomposing bodies. I mean, we lived with it. And they were in total shock. So uh, I knew that this was a, a wonderful thing. And you know, you are liberated, but first it was, am I free? What am I going to do now? I can't get up, get off the ground. So it was, um, it was sort of touch and go. The irony of it was that we were dying from starvation, many more, I mean, 
you know, I had some better rations after I was in the operating room, but many others didn't. We were dying from starvation. Now when the Americans brought up an army kitchen and they started to cook up a meal, stew, and they fed it to people, I said, I will never stay in a lineup again for as long as I live. I wasn't going to go there to the kitchen. First, I couldn't get off the ground, and the smell of the food was actually making me sick. You don't want food anymore. And uh, everybody was naked, and they had a pot of stew, and they ate it. You could see them. They were like a little pregnant, and two minutes later, they simply dropped that. Their stomachs ruptured, and it killed them. So uh, it was a big dilemma for them. They didn't know how to deal with these thousands of people. And uh, we had to be fed with an eyedropper, but who had that kind of... Uh, infrastructure to bring us back to a normal health. You know, it wasn't possible. So it was a long haul, and it took me three years to become <clears throat> mentally and physically um, uh, healthy. That's what I want to pick up on. How, how is it possible, given everything you went through, the destruction of your entire family, the deprivation, the murder, the, all of the killing you saw, the inhumanity, how is it that you, you are not a completely broken person? Well, I tell you, when I came back to my home, it took me three weeks to come back from Avensee, from Austria. I went with trains for a few kilometers, and the bridges were blown up. Uh, in the last few kilometers, I got on a Russian troop train, and they, I went a certain distance, and then on a farmer's cart, and uh, <clears throat> I came back to my home. I could see my home. That home was a busy place a year before. And I knew that there would be nobody there. But I was hoping that my, our dog, Farkash, who was a big Alsatian dog, he was our guardian. And uh, he would have known when I was a half kilometer away, he would have sensed. I was hoping that he will be there. And I'm that close, and Farkash isn't there. This place that was such a busy place, chickens, geese, and ducks were roaming all over. Total quiet. It was a dead building, and I opened the door. A neighbor was sitting there, and she got scared looking at this monster. I mean, I was in terrible shape. I had pleurisy, and I, my body was blown up. I couldn't lay down. I, my, the water was up to here. It was choking me. And you used to sleep sitting up. I was sleeping. Sitting up, I couldn't lay down. So she wouldn't give me a glass of water. And I tell you, that moment, I said, my God, what am I going to do now? And that was really a very, so I went to see this neighbor, Ili Klinka. And uh, she saw me, and she was in shock. She gave me a bath. My head was full of lice. And uh, she said, well, I have to take you to the doctor tomorrow morning. And she did, and uh, they put me on a Horse and buggy took me away to the hospital in Kasha, 50 kilometers away. That was a very crucial moment. And you're back home, and you don't have a home. It's, you know, you have nothing. I had no clothes. She gave me some old clothes. So in the hospital, somebody came to visit a uh, gentleman. His name was Joseph Gottlieb. He came to visit to see if there were any Jewish patients. It was called St. Elizabeth. Hospital it was manned by nuns. The sisters were all nuns with their big habits. They were amazing, kind nurses. And uh, so he came and he said, who are you? I said, I'm Tibor Eisen. That, that's my real name. She, he says, Eisen. He says, from where? I said, well, from Moldova. He says, well, you know, my mother's brother was an Eisen. So we figured out that we are related. So uh, he said, look, when you get out of the hospital, you have to come to our home. He came back. He returned from the camps with his son and three daughters. The three daughters were actually hiding in, uh, with Christian papers. Hmm. But he, his wife, and his son, they were deported to uh, the camps, and his wife died in the camp. And when he came back, he married a, uh, another lady. So when three months later, when I came out of the hospital, I went to their home for a few months. And uh, I mean, I was that thin. 
You see, the pleurisy was a wet pleurisy. The water was pumped out from my spine with a oh. side wrench. It had a needle about that big. They used to inject it into they the ribs. They put it in I the back between my ribs, and, and the nurses <laughs> said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, keep pumping, you know, and, uh, and I had spent a few months there, and um, they fattened me up. She was an amazing cook, and uh, his son, Isaac Yitzchak, we became good friends, and um, so that sort of gave me a leg up. And, uh, and, you know, it was sort of, you know, you could sort of feel sorry for yourself. I kept thinking, look how lucky Yitzchak is. He's got a father, sisters, and here I still have nobody, you know. It's this feeling of being alone it was a real big, when I saw a brother, two brothers together, two brothers came back in my town, and I said, look how lucky they are. And you have to get over all these things because it could drive you, you know, down a bad way if you really give up. And uh, so uh, fortunately, uh, the Jewish community was getting more organized. And there was an American, American Joint Distribution Committee. They opened up a school, a yeshiva in Mariambad. Mariambad is a world famous spa outside Prague. So when I heard about it, three of us, we got on the train. We had no money. We, wherever we went, you know, we just got on the train and we went. We had nothing. And money wasn't worth anything anyway. And so we went to this place, Mariambad, and there was a pension. The town gave us this pension. It belonged to the old Sudeten people who were deported from Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. after the war. And eventually there were about 35 or 40 of us in this place. And we were supported by the American Joint. They fed us. Uh, all the supplies were brought from American, from the American zone. And uh, a rabbi came with his wife from Budapest. And a couple came, and they were our cooks with a kosher operation. You know, they cooked strictly kosher. And uh, the beauty of that place, and I found a, um, I became an apprentice at the dentist's office, he had a dental lab. And in Europe, every dentist has their own lab, and they have a master technician. So I became an apprentice, learning uh, <laughs> to be a dental technician. And he was a master technician, Herr Tutz, he was a Sudeten German. He took me under his wings, and I was now a real person. You know, I had a lab coat, and uh, I was learning, and I really loved it. I had very good hands. And so I spent three years there. We had a ball there. I mean, we really became real normal people after a while. You know, the first year, we had to decompress. We had these wild urges. I mean, this pension had the most beautiful furniture. It had Persian rugs. It had furniture and beautiful dishes. We destroyed everything. There wasn't a chair that had a single leg or the tables. I mean, we just had this urge to and then we settled down, and uh, so. I want to ask you one more thing. Yeah. There are many people who've been through the Holocaust who cannot talk about it. Mm -hmm. It happened 70 years ago, but it doesn't matter. Even with the passage of seven decades, they simply can't go back there. It's too hard. You obviously have taken a different decision. You have made it, in some respects, your life's mission now to educate, to tell people what happened. How come? You know, when I started to speak, Canada was a different world, and the world is, was a different place. And uh, would I have known that eventually, 25 years later, I will see this poison re, uh, reoccurring again, hatred of Jews, right in this country? I mean, would I have ever thought? I thought that I left it all behind in Europe, and now it's come after us here. And uh, I'm speaking in particular. Um, the BDS movements in universities. Uh, that is very concerning. And um, uh, boycott, divest, sanction. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions. You know, Jews are running away from Europe. There were 12 million Jews living in Europe before the war. There's maybe 2 million Jews. And Jews are running away from Europe. Why? A Jew cannot wear a kippah in Paris, in London, in Amsterdam, in Brussels, or in Budapest. Maybe in Berlin. Hmm. 
Isn't that ironic? Isn't this ironic? So these are very important signals that are coming my way, and this is why we sort of uh, shifted into a higher gear. We, many of us survivors, we speak about this. We feel this, that there is a big problem coming. And how do we impart this? God help everybody that they don't have to repeat the same mistakes again. How they need to be aware. You see, everything starts with words. Like a case of bullying starts with words. But the words lead to Auschwitz. This is the bottom line. And uh, this is why in our last few years that we have, we're trying to tell you people, if we lose this freedom here in this country, and it's lost just like this BDS movement, that's the way it started in Nazi Germany, exactly the same way. How come that in Canada and universities are using a system that the Nazis started? It's a deceptive system. It actually, what it means is excommunication, expulsion, extermination. This is what they're meaning about the BDS movement. That's what it is. So we know the facts, but many people may say, well, what does Max know? I mean, I know, we know, we go by our gut feelings. And um, so this is why we are doing this. And uh, if we have a chance to stand in front of kids and tell them that, uh, look, <clears throat> what you can learn from our story, it's so important, and you know, we are invited to many schools, and I wonder why, you know, we are still invited after all these years. You know, I have thousands of letters that I have from students. I have 10 or 12 two-inch binders full of letters thanking me, giving me feedback. And I keep telling them, you know, you need to respect each other, no matter what religion or color, or color anybody is. And I try to tell them, do not buy everything that you hear. Try to sift the truth. And um, this is the best that we can do. And uh, I've experienced living under fascism, Nazism, and communism in Czechoslovakia. And any, anything that ends with an ism is not a good thing. It's a, a, the Nazis had a supremacist Nazi ideology. Anyone with different features, with uh, racial features or religious beliefs, what they said, they're going to be simply eliminated or Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, be careful what you buy. And uh, I think this is what our message is. Mr. Risen, you have written an amazing book, By Chance Alone, A Remarkable True Story of Courage and Survival at Auschwitz, Max Eisen has been our guest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.